All right. I think we're good to go. All right. So Ninjapreneurs, today I have the awesome pleasure of introducing to you our special speaker, Murtaza Bambot. Uh, Murtaza is the founder of Harpy, which many of you know is the platform we host our Life, Ninja, Life Ninjas community on. So a lot of you are using that platform right now if you came in through um, the event link. And through Heartbeat, he's worked with over 5,000, that's insane, <laughs> communities, helping them build, launch, and scale. Let me just admit our next person here. There we go. Um, build, launch, and scale to profitability, which I think we all want, right? In the last year, Heartbeat has helped community builders make over $2 million. How many of you want a piece of that pie and to learn how they did that? I'm, I'm going to raise my hand. Uh, Murtis has been building and leading communities for over 10 years. And before Heartbeat, he ran online gaming guilds, student clubs, professional organizations, was the head of community for Georgia Tech's Startup Accelerator. He's got just an amazing resume. <laughs> uh, today, he's living in Chicago, spends his free time binge watching shows, cooking, exploring new restaurants. He's a foodie, y'all. Um, and you guys, Having been very involved in Heartbeat's community and working very closely with him and even being on the Heartbeat team for a spell, I can tell you personally that this guy knows what it takes to make a profitable community. And he has a passion for helping community builders, not to mention he's just a super cool dude. So <laughs> grab your notebooks, grab your pens, be ready to, ready to take some screenshots or whatever you need to do um, to store this information, <laughs> ask questions in the chat. I will try to collect them as we go. And um, with that, I'll just say, take it away, Mordeza. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh man, that was such a kind intro. Uh, I'm excited to dive in here. Like talking about building communities and building paid communities is like my favorite thing. Uh, just like Missy said, like any questions that you have, feel free to drop them into the Zoom chat. I'll keep it up on my second monitor. And then Missy is also going to help me kind of like surface up questions. Um, that's what makes these calls fun, by the way, is rather than just kind of running through the slides, getting the jam and kind of work together on this is what really, really excites me. Um, so as we go through this, anything that you got, feel free to drop it into the the, uh, the Zoom chat. So uh, we talked a little bit about my background uh, at the start. Uh, just the, the quick high level that I'll give you of like really why I'm, I'm qualified to teach this is I built my first community and got it to 100K in uh, annual revenue when I was 19. It was about 70% membership fees, 30% sponsorships, um, was head of community, the second largest accelerator in the world. Uh, and I've helped thousands of communities build, launch, and make money on Heartbeat. Uh, and really, it's by just embedding some of the best practices of what it takes to build a great online business today in 2023. And so that's kind of what we're going to be covering. We'll talk about why building paid memberships is so profitable today, what's changed over the last like 10, 15 years that makes this such a lucrative business that you can run, scale, and grow for the long term, not just like another one-year, two-year fad, but something that you can really build uh, and grow as a business for yourself for the next five years, 10 years. Uh, how to create a really powerful and irresistible offering, building the community and getting your first customers in the door, and then how you can keep iterating and scaling and growing as you've actually gotten sort of the initial piece of the community put together and, and how you're going to go ahead and get that to the actual 120000 a year uh, annual recurring revenue mark. So the first thing that we're going to cover as we dive into this is that this is going to be hard. Like this is not just going to be some like easy peasy thing. There's no get rich quick schemes here. Like community building takes time and work and intentionality, and you will have to put in a lot of this in there. Uh, so it's not going to be an easy thing, but the hope is, is that we can demystify a lot of the parts of the journey so that you know that when you are putting in these hours, when you are working, you're working on the right things that are going to make your community as successful as possible. The other piece of this is that you really don't need a massive audience or email list to be able to do this successfully. I've just been so blown away at the number of like heartbeat creators that have uh, gone from no email list to like 50K in annual revenue, 100K in annual revenue in just a year. Uh, it is surprisingly fast how quickly you can build and scale these organizations. And it's due to just like really figuring out what are the things that you need to work on that optimize your time the most. And then the very last thing is just ask lots of questions over here. Like I said, that's what makes these calls really fun. So let's talk a little bit about why making, why building these paid memberships are so profitable. So if you are, you know, if you have some degree of expertise, you have something that you want to rally people around, get people excited around, uh, there's kind of like two options for you to make money here. You can do uh, coaching, you can sell courses online, uh, but when you're selling either of these products, there's basically two ways that you grow your revenue. 
Either you just create more products and sell them to the exact same people over and over and over again. And this puts you on this just like constant content creation hamster wheel where every couple of weeks you have to make a new course and new course and new course and keep selling it. Or two, you have to just keep finding more and more people to bring in the door and you are constantly marketing and trying to build, bring people in. And that's just to maintain the current amount of money that you're making every week, every month. And so the end result is that it's really hard to run these businesses and then not burn out because you are just on a hamster wheel the entire time. And you are trying to figure out just how do you get 24 or 25 uh, hours in a day uh, and actually put that back in your business. And so the solution here is that we need to figure out ways to build subscription revenue products that you can sell once and then continue growing and making revenue off of over a long period of time. Because what that MRR does, that monthly recurring revenue, is it creates reliability in your business. It allows you to then go in and project out the month of November, I'm gonna make this much, the month of December, the month of January. And with that reliability, now you can go on and hire a team. You can hire on VAs, you can hire on part-time people, you can hire on full-time people to help you build and grow and scale this. Because by the time this gets to being a larger profitable business, it's gonna be impossible to do with a team of one person. You will have to bring on some other folks, but you wanna have reliability in your business so that you know that you can make payroll every month. Uh, Cause trust me, I know exactly how scary it is to be on the 14th and just like praying that you can hit everything to, to make payroll. So the goal here is to build MRR, and the idea is to build recurring uh, uh, reliability and stability into your business. And so we want to talk about how do you actually transition some of the products that you're selling today into, uh, you know, memberships and into subscription revenue offerings. So a lot of the ways that we've seen this happen with other communities on Heartbeat, and these are experts in any different kind of thing. We've seen celebrity chefs do this. We've seen knitting instructors do this. We've seen uh, fitness instructors, workout teachers, all different types of folks is any kind of one-on-one -on -one coaching that you're doing, shifting it into group coaching events. So instead of doing like one-on-one -on -one sessions, do sessions of five people, 10 people, bring everybody together in a group and emphasize the fact that the group is the feature. Like that is the benefit of why you're coming in. It is that you're not just getting the expertise and advice from one person. You are getting the expertise and advice from six other people that are trying to solve the same problems that you are, that are in the trenches with you. So step one is often just shifting over into more group experiences and figuring out how do you take the experiences that you have and make some of those transitions. Number two is as an expert in anything, you are naturally going to get a lot of questions about it. Uh, and so taking a lot of those ad hoc questions and turning them into lasting content. Uh, oftentimes it's writing like articles. For me, I don't love writing. And so that's why if you look at like all of the stuff that I put out, it's always Loom videos. Uh, and that's because I've always found it to just be like a million times easier to just stand in front of a camera, share some thoughts and have that. Uh, and uh, you know, that's how I get all the content out. That's how I answer out a lot of the like really basic questions or even like the starter questions that people have. And so if you look at like Heartbeats user guide and things like that, that's the why it's all, uh, you know, just videos is because that was the easiest thing for me to do and make sure we were getting out answers to all the questions that we had coming in. And then the last thing that I would think about is how you are actually building learning journeys in here, like courses. Uh, how are you using them around onboarding? How can you use them around building like live cohort-based courses where there is a community element baked in the course as you're bringing people through this? And then as you're doing all this, think about what you need to charge to make this work. So uh, what we find is on average for hobbyist communities, it tends to be between 25 a month and 50 a month. And then this is like hobbyist, I mean like, you know, the cooking communities, the knitting communities, like those types of things. And then for the business communities, so like marketing communities, sales communities, design communities, uh, we see a hover usually between like 50 bucks a month and 100 bucks a month. But keep in mind that these prices are just like a starting point. Uh, we've seen, I think the max we've seen someone charge, like we've seen people go to like 300 a month, 500 a month. The most I've ever seen is like 2000 a month on Heartbeat. Uh, and so the sky really is the limit in terms of like how much you can actually charge for these communities. Uh, it's all about like whether you can craft an offering that is genuine, authentic, something that you can actually deliver on and something that people actually want. And so that's what we're gonna talk about next. But before we dive into that, I just wanted to pause real quick are there any questions that I'm, I'm missing in the Zoom chat? Anything that I should just like take a look at? Uh, nothing yet, really. Okay, sweet. Uh, cool. And as you guys have stuff that's coming up, uh, just like as, as I'm talking through things, just feel free to go ahead and keep dropping in the Zoom chat and we'll surface it. 
So next step is how do we create that irresistible offering? Like how do we create something that's so good that uh, in the words of uh, Alex Hermosi down here, how do we make an offering so good that people feel stupid for saying no? Uh, how do we jam pack all of this value, all of this amazing stuff into one offering that people just absolutely have to take? And so the first question that I always tell people to ask themselves is if you put yourself in your customer's shoes, like what does a dream outcome look like? So for example, if we talk about like a cooking community, for cooking communities, oftentimes it's just giving people confidence in their kitchen and making sure people feel like no matter how busy their schedule gets, they always feel like they can cook up and whip up a meal that feels healthy and feels good for them. Uh, so what do those dream outcomes look like? Sometimes it's confidence for the hearth, our customer community. We wanna help people be confident in building and launching profitable communities. Like that's what the dream outcome looks like is you have a business that you are running full time and like that is what you are growing and scaling and you know we're putting money back in your pockets so that's the first thing that i would recommend thinking about is like if you kind of like play this all out in the future someone comes into your community they attend all of the events they finish all of the courses they comment on all of the content they're reading every single thing that you're doing how does their life look different like six months from now 12 months from now like what changes what confidence does it give them what skills does it give them and how does their kind of you know how does their life really shift so that's what i would immediately think about and then from there is how likely is it that you're actually going to achieve this so if i tell you that hey i can help you build a paid community and i'm going to give you all this content resources in the best case scenario if you go through everything what is the like percentage likelihood that you're actually going to hit that and then without me, what is the percentage likelihood that you're going to hit that? So a really good example here is if you think about like fitness communities, right? Like this is a really common thing that like personal trainers will do is they'll come in and they'll say, you know, hey, we're going to create workout plans for you. We're going to create nutrition plans and guides and things like that. It's going to be hard. Like you're going to have to put in the work and the time and the effort. But if you follow all the things that I'm saying in 12 months, you will have, you know, the, the dream body that you want. Uh, but more importantly, you'll have the tools and the skills necessary to be able to continue and carry on this and be able to be the your, your most healthy self. Uh, and so, you know, it's going to take you 12 months. The likelihood that you achieve it if you do it with me as a personal trainer is like 90 percent. Uh, if you just look at what are the stats of people achieving their fitness goals and, you know, New Year's resolutions uh, on their own, it's going to be like 15%, maybe 20%. And so that's the difference is I'm going to take you from a 15% chance of success to a 90% chance of success. And it's going to take some time. It's going to take 12 months and it's going to take you time each week. I'm going to expect about 10 hours of work uh, from you each week to help make this happen. Right. So you're very, very clearly giving the commitment up front of what are you actually giving to them? What do they have to put in? And then what does that dream outcome look like? So like a basic example of this, right? And I'm just, I'm literally modeling this off of the talk that we're doing right now is, you know, my example offer can be, I'm going to help you build a profitable community that makes over 120,000 a year. And on average, from what we've seen, only 15% of communities really reach this goal. But if you work with me, you do all the steps, you actually do all of the stuff that we're telling you to do, 85% of you will hit this goal. And all I need from you is 10 hours a week over the next three months, 10 hours of really hardcore work. Like it's not going to be easy. It's going to be a lot of, you know, time. It's going to be a lot of intentionality, but 10 hours a week over the next three months. And we can hit this. Now this offer starts to seem a lot more appealing. Like this is something that I can charge 500 a month for. I can charge a thousand for, uh, like this is something that I can put together make it really nice and make it really powerful and then create something that, you know, people are willing to pay for because they can immediately see the outcome that they're getting. They can immediately see kind of, uh, you know, what, what is going to make a difference for them. Um, one of the questions that I saw that popped up in the zoom chat was from, from TJ, which is like, how do you create value that increases prices? And the most immediate thing is like, if you already know your customers, you can kind of start spitballing and putting some stuff together and then just jumping on calls and testing and seeing if people bite, if they like it and they want to buy in and pay for it. If you've never done this before, then what I would do is I would just jump on exploratory calls with people. Uh, so if you're thinking about, you know, doing a community around online writing, I would reach out to a bunch of people uh, that have either tried online writing and it hasn't really worked out for them or, you know, are thinking about trying online writing. And you could just do some like LinkedIn posts or some like, you know, tweets or things like that to try and find some of these folks and say, hey, I just want to do like a 15 minute call with you to understand. And then just ask them questions, right? Like, what do you like about writing? What do you dislike about writing? What makes it easier for you? What do you wish you had? Like if you could wave your magic wand and like create a program that would help you get there, like what does the dream outcome for you look like, right? Like how does online help writing 
help you in your life, help you in your business? Uh, what what changes does that make for you, right? So like the, the easy answer of like, how do you increase value? Go talk to your customers, figure out what your potential customers care about, what matters to them, and then just ask them the really basic questions of like, what would you pay more money for? Um, like sometimes just that question itself is like a really easy question to unlock. What does it take to increase my price points from say 50 bucks a month to hundred bucks a month? So that's kind of what I would I would do is I would just go back to, to talking to customers. Uh, and we do this at Heartbeat. We do this like every six months. We do like big surveys that we send out to folks. But we are also taking calls with uh, people building communities like every single week. Every single week, like we have about like 10 to 20 customers that we're talking with one on one just to get an understanding of like what works for them, what doesn't work for them, what are they trying to improve on? Where's Heartbeat faltering? Where can we make some you know adjustments and shore up the experience a little bit? So like that's kind of how we think about it, too, is it's, it is a constant cycle of just talking to customers and understanding their needs. Uh, ideally, if you are building this community, you're building this in a space that you care about, uh, that becomes a lot more fun. For me, I like kind of like Missy said at the start, like I just love talking to other community builders. Like you guys are such a fun bunch. Uh, you spend your days thinking about how to bring people together. So like every single call is just like an absolute delight. Uh, and you guys are building businesses like me, right? And so like there's so many unspoken things that are just baked into those conversations. Like I don't have to worry, do you care about this call? Are you actually paying attention and things like that? You're building a business, I know you are. Uh, and so like for me, those calls are really, really fun because I just love the types of customers that we work with. And that's kind of like an aside that's like not built into the slide deck, but like focus on customer sets that you genuinely enjoy spending time with, because otherwise this thing is just going to be a slog as you're building it. Cool. So let's pause for a second, right? Um, think about the ideal customer that you have in your mind. What does a dream outcome look like for them? And this just needs to be like a couple words. It doesn't need to be anything super crazy. Uh, give me your half-baked thoughts. Give me your like initial like, you know, takes of like how you're thinking about this. And a couple examples that I dropped down below over here is like the first one, build a profitable community that makes 120K a year. Second example is build kitchen confidence and cook healthy meals no matter how busy you are. And then the third one is grow your online business with writing that reliably goes viral. So go ahead and drop into the Zoom chat kind of what you're thinking over here. And once you do that, we're, we're also going to take a second and break down some of these statements too. Awesome. Uh, yeah, Charlotte mentioned I'm taking a big leap going from a one-time buy online course with a community to a membership community, 100% heartbeat. Love it. So excited about that. Um, and Charlotte, I know a lot of what you're doing is teaching people kind of like how to unlock their inner artist, right? Yeah, <laughs> and that takes time. It's a long way, so uh, it's not like um, when you when you have a, a promise like build a profitable community that makes a lot of money for my for my clients. Like the the dream is like to be an artist, and this is very very far away and not very concrete. So yeah, uh, I I take back what you said uh, earlier. You have to talk with the client and understand what he needs to go through, and that's. That's how you, you build it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so I love that you brought that up because I think that's a really common thing that a lot of people go through as they, they build a community is figuring out like what does the pie in the sky goal look like, right? Uh, like you mentioned, if the goal is to be an artist, that is a huge, very lofty goal. And we're not going to snap our fingers and have that happen in two weeks. Yeah. But what we can think about is what are and, the like... <laughs> Yeah, right. Uh, that you climb up and do that. So this one's funny because I actually one of my first uh, when we were first kicking up, like getting heartbeat started, uh, I was testing out a lot of these like cohort based courses and things like that. And so one of the courses I bought this for my girlfriend because she does a lot of painting is a one month course that teaches you how to improvise paintings, like massive paintings. Uh, and they gave you a couple examples of what that looked like. And so that was the course is it wasn't become an expert artist overnight, but it was, hey, in 30 days, we're gonna teach you the skills to take an entire blank canvas and improv the entire thing in a way that feels genuine and authentic to you. And that was the value prop. And really great value prop if you think about it, right? Because it's like, there's so many artists that are just like, all right, I've, I've painted so many apples. What do I do now? Um, and so like you have people that are trying to figure out like, what can I, what gives me skills that I can kind of continue on on my own? A lot of the like fitness communities we see on Heartbeat do that too, where it's like fitness is an ongoing journey. You can't just work out really heavily for three months and then it's, it's good to go. Uh, but it's thinking about like, how do you build that life 
into, you know, your current daily activities? Like, how do you make space for it? And how do you build the routines for it? So that moving forward, you're set up for success to continue building on these skills. And so that's kind of what I would think about is like, how do we break this massive goal into kind of the steps and the ledges that it takes to get there? Awesome. Uh, oh, I love this one from David of transform your passion for crafting from a mere weekend hobby to becoming the main source of your income. I love that. I love that. Um, and that's perfect, right? Because it's basically saying like, hey, we're not going to build you a crafting business that makes you 10 million a year, but we're going to teach you how to make some revenue and turn this into a business that then you can grow and scale, right? Like we're giving you the skills to help go out and accomplish that. I love that. Awesome. And so one thing that I, I also will touch on over here that uh, I, I haven't like explicitly written in the slides is what we're doing over here with each of these is we're also thinking about what are the things that stop people from doing this by themselves? So if I said, you know, build kitchen confidence and cook healthy meals, what is stopping people from doing that? No matter how busy you are. So making sure that regardless of how busy life gets, uh, you can always, you know, be able to cook up and whip up a meal. And so immediately addressing the most common concerns people have when they look at, pro, uh, when they look at you know, uh, uh, memberships and things like that. Um, the second one is grow your online business with writing that reliably grows viral. Uh, I've done a lot of online writing and the biggest frustration with online writing is you spend time, you write an amazing piece and you post it and nobody likes it, nobody comments on it and it dies and goes into the void. Uh, and so with that, what we did is we added in the reliably goes viral piece so that you know like, hey, this is writing that's going to help you move your business forward and it's gonna accomplish the goals that you want. It's not just writing for the sake of writing. Cool. All right. Let me jump into the Zoom chat because I saw another one come in from Natasha. So I'm struggling. Mine is roughly to build habits and confidence in learning French that allows you to feel comfortable speaking French for real. Doesn't sound right yet. Uh, that's, I think that's a great start though, right? Like we're, we're going to work on the pieces and like over time, this will get more and more tightened up. Uh, but even just saying that, Hey, we're building a community that makes it so that you are comfortable speaking French with native French speakers. Like even that, uh, is, is a pretty powerful value prop for anybody that's learning a language. Uh, I'm actually learning a language right now. Like my girlfriend and I, we take Arabic classes twice a week at night. Uh, and so like for us, the value prop is we want to be able to go to Egypt and speak in Arabic. Like that's, that's it. Like that's all that matters to us. We want to be able to speak the language and feel like we can be involved in the culture. Uh, we both come from Muslim roots and never learned Arabic growing up. And so we just wanted to like learn a piece that was like a little part of our culture. Um, so yeah, I would, I would kind of think about like, what does that look like as it's kind of playing out in people's lives, but it doesn't need to be, you know, making 120 K a year. Sometimes all people really want is, is confidence. Cool. Uh, Oh, awesome. I'm looking at another one from Debbie, which is I want to bring entrepreneurial creatives together to learn, to reinvent their skills and prepare for a more continuous landscape of change. I like that. And we can even probably like tailor that down is I want to help entrepreneurs adapt to every obstacle. Right. Uh, so a way to make sure that you are building the flexibility and the skills and the adaptiveness that you need to scale and grow your business. I love that. Awesome. Jumping into the next piece of this. Um, oh, one, one more is from Selena. Streamline your online business with AI and automation so that you can win your time back. Love it, right? Because we're immediately saying, hey, we're going to streamline your business. And we're immediately bringing up the biggest concern. It's like, oh, it's going to take time to learn this. I'm going to have to do this. And we're kind of turning it into a positive and saying like, hey, you're going to win your time back. And you're going to have so much more time in your day to execute. Love it. One from David as well. Oh, yes. Transform your spiritual growth from a dogma-based stick up to an actual relationship with the Lord. Uh, love it. Okay, cool. Yeah. And, and this is something that I think is, is really powerful too. Like, I think a lot of these, uh, community really lends itself powerfully to a lot of these, um, like non-work goals that people have. So their spirituality, a lot of like, like even just thinking about like crafts, skills, like their creativity, what they want to explore. Because if you think about it, like, there's not a lot of places that you can go to in person to like figure out this kind of stuff. Uh, like for example, I, I gave this talk a little bit earlier and had someone who talked about a community that teaches you music theory so that you can help improv and you know create your own music. Uh, and like I grew up in Atlanta, which is one of the music capitals of the world. I don't know who I would go to to learn that. But the fact that I can go online and find that makes it so much easier. Uh, and so I really think that a lot of these like non-work activities, like a lot of the other areas of your life that you want to get better at and you want to improve on, really lend itself well to community because it is so hard to like find those specific niches in person. Cool. So uh, jumping into, jumping back into the slides, 
one thing that I also recognize here is that community is a very overloaded term. Like this is something that we realize kind of like day one at Heartbeat is it's it's a fluffy word. It encompasses a lot of stuff. It's been really watered down over the last couple of years as everybody and their mother has started a community. Uh, and so like people see the word community and they don't really know what to expect, what they're going to get. Um, it's hard to sell just by itself. It's hard to say like, hey, do you want to just pay and come join my community? And so the workaround for this is actually selling the experiences that you use to build and craft and put together your community instead. So here's what I mean by that. If we look at a online writing community, kind of what I touched on earlier, the goal is to grow your business with online writing that reliably goes viral. And the way that we do that is we have a live course with everyone else in the community that happens four times a year that's going to focus on pieces of online writing that'll help you. And it'll constantly be updated with the most relevant information. And then we're going to have a channel in the community where you can post your writing and get pretty much instant feedback on it. And then number three is every month we're going to bring in a really prolific writer to do an expert AMA where you can ask them any question. They'll talk about their process, their story, what works for them, uh, and you know how they've been able to grow their following. And so you can build this, you break it down into experiences, and that's really what you sell to folks is you tell them like, hey, these are the things that you're actually going to get out of the community. Uh, and if we look at this as an entire kind of like business in a box, uh, with the price points that we're charging, like these three things, if we're actually going to help people get, you know, reliably viral, that's worth 500 a quarter. People will pay that. Uh, and at this price point, we really only need 60 customers to hit 120,000 a year to hit our mark. For a, another example, which is more like uh, uh, like personal focused, is like a cooking community. Uh, so this one I actually borrowed from a heartbeat community that I know is, is doing pretty well, uh, is build kitchen confidence and cook healthy meals regardless of how busy you are. So what they do is they do four videos each month with new cooking practices. Uh, and so it's once a week, they'll talk about different knife skills, they'll talk about preparation skills, they'll go through basic recipes that are really good use of those skills. Uh, each week there are office hours to help you answer your questions, say, you know, hey, I'm struggling with this, or I want to figure out how to get better at meal prepping or things like that. So you can jump in, ask any questions to the founders of the communities. And then uh, there's recipes that are full of healthy, quick, great tasting, uh, you know, or channels that are full of, you know, healthy, quick, great tasting recipes. So that if you have a busy day, you can scroll, click on a recipe, open that, and it'll take you 20 minutes to cook. And that's what the whole community is focused on, right? They're not focused on making these four hour, eight hour long meals that take a lot of time and energy and sweat and toiling over it. That's not what they're about. They're about helping busy people be able to cook regularly and make some time in their day for some cooking and some self-love. Uh, and that's really what they're about. And so for them at 30 bucks a month, they need 300 customers to get 120K a year. And if you think about the value prop and how universal this is and how much value this actually brings you, that's not an impossible goal. Like that feels pretty attainable. Uh, and they do that by, you know, doing a lot of like, uh, you know, public events and things like that to bring people in, like live cooking sessions, things like that. And then they turn it into a, a community where you're paying monthly. They don't have to worry about the reliability of how much money am I making the next month and they can grow and scale it pretty sustainably. Um, cool. Uh, oh, we had another great question that came in from uh, Gina, which is any tips on a close ended process? I help people finish their doctoral degree. So it's a clear journey, but everyone is on their own at some point in the journey. Yeah, um, this is super interesting. I actually I'm working with a, a customer right now who's building a community for medical residents, uh, which is it's a five year journey that most four year, five year, sometimes six year journey that they're going through. But at the end, you're out like you're done. You don't need to be in there. Uh, and so it's definitely very doable. There's a couple things to consider is one, I do think your pricing needs to be slightly adjusted to like uh, kind of account for the transitory nature of these folks. Uh, so I would probably think about maybe like quarterly pricing or annual pricing and have that be the only option and instead do like you know, it's going to cost this much a quarter, but you have a 30 day refund period. So if you get to day 30 and you don't like it, then let us know and we'll click a button on Stripe and we'll refund the whole thing. So I would think about adjusting the price points to be longer. And then the second thing that I would think about is what happens when people leave, right? When they leave, uh, the, the like more common way that people do this is it's just like, all right, you finish your doctoral degree, you're out, you're good to go. Bye. 
the more like community-esque way to do this is to create like actual community celebrations and make this a ritual of the community is every spring and every fall actually bringing together the people on a call, doing like an AMA with them and celebrating their achievement that they've actually gone through and like knocked through this thing and, and gotten their doctoral degree, right? And so building that celebration as part of the community is like a big thing that you can do. And then the last piece of this is figuring out what you want to do with those folks that have graduated because they can still give back they can be leaders in the community they can come and help out they've seen all the value that they got through it as they were going through their degree how can you work with them to actually spread out the load and grow this a little bit so that way maybe you do have to focus a little bit more time on marketing and bring people in because people won't be in the community for 10 years but you can spread out the workload by bringing in the folks that finish their degrees to come in and serve as mentors and help out. So that's kind of like the way that I would think about it. Yeah. Awesome. Glad to hear that that helped. Sweet. And if there's any other questions, especially if there's like community specific or like process specific questions, like feel free to drop them in there. Uh, like, like Misty mentioned, I, I have seen like every way, shape or form of community at this point. Uh, so we've been blessed with a lot of experience of what works well. Uh, and so happy to share that and dive into deep into, into some other examples too. Cool. So I actually want to pause right here, right? We've talked a lot about how you can build these communities around the experiences that you're offering. So if you just like ballpark and kind of think about the folks that you're working with, let's think about what are two experiences that would be a really good fit for them uh, that would give them and help them deliver the value here. Uh, and you don't have to write out the whole thing. You can just grab, I've got like a couple experiences listed from one to seven. You can drop the, the numbers into the Zoom chat. Um, I'll explain them really quickly. Feedback channel is just a place where you can drop, you know, your work you're, you're doing and get feedback from other folks. Monthly expert AMAs, bring in an expert. You can ask them anything on a Zoom call. Weekly office hours are kind of explanatory. You jump onto a Zoom call for an hour. During that hour, anybody can jump in and jump out and ask questions. Weekly videos and content is kind of self-explanatory. Live cohort-based courses is like a, a course that you do with your community over the course of maybe four weeks, maybe 12 weeks that everyone does together, attends the lectures together, does the homeworks together. Uh, and then that way there's a little bit more of a community aspect around that. Accountability groups are a little self-explanatory. And then like monthly hot seats is where you'll bring in a member of your community. They'll have a couple problems that they want to uh, work through. And you basically do a one-on-one -on -one coaching with them live and have the rest of the community and as the audience kind of listening in and seeing how you're thinking about things and how you're helping them out. Awesome. Okay, cool. Uh, David mentioned courses and brainstorming sessions. Love that. Uh, Sheila mentioned five and seven. So live cohort based courses and monthly hot seats. Love that. Yeah, very, very learning focused. Awesome. Uh, yeah, keep dropping stuff in there because it's also helpful for me to see. Uh, one, three, four, and seven. So one is a feedback channel, two is uh, three is weekly office hours, four is weekly videos and content, and then seven is monthly hot seats. Uh, and what I will say is as you're starting out, I actually recommend doing fewer and doing them really well. Uh, Charlotte, I also know that you're in kind of a unique situation where you've been like running your community for a while and there's like a big transition coming. Um, but if you're just starting off, you're getting your first customers in the door, I probably recommend starting off with one or two. If you've been running running this business for a while, then feel free to experiment and run into like three, four, uh, and, and tighten those up and make sure that they're all really, really stellar experiences. Uh, Gina mentioned number two. Uh, oh, I'm trying to do number two, monthly expert AMAs. Uh, I do six and seven right now. Okay, awesome. Um, and then uh, we had one and seven feedback and then monthly hot seats, one and five feedback, and then live cohort-based courses. Jason said four and seven. So weekly videos and content, seven like monthly hot seats. Love it. And the way that I would even think about this is like, at least one of the experiences that you choose should allow people to see other people kind of face to face. That that really helps out a lot as you're building out these digital communities is like being able to see other people's face on the Zoom calls, recognizing that you're seeing the same folks over and over again. And so as you're thinking about this, I would think about having one of these be more event based and the other one can be more content based. You can do event based as well. Uh, if you look at what we do in the hearth, when we first started off, we were only doing event based uh, activities. We never did any kind of like content based stuff or anything like that. And only in the last year has we have we shifted to doing a lot more like content based stuff in there. Cool. So we've talked a little bit about how you can build the offering, how you can build the community, and then what are the experiences that you're building that are going to get people really, really excited about the work that you're doing and get people to want to come in and pay for this. Now we have to actually go out and get customers that are going to pay for this. 
And so what I recommend is jumping on calls with every single one of your initial customers. So every single person that's coming through your sales pipeline, just jump on a Zoom call with them. It can be 15 minutes, it can be 20 minutes, and just get an understanding of what they care about and what matters to them. And that face-to-face, -face, you know, Zoom face-to-face -face interaction uh, will allow you to see so much of the in-between the lines, like kind of decision-making. Maybe you're on a call with a customer uh, and you talk to them about the, uh, you know, uh, expert uh, AMAs that are happening every month and you see their eyes light up. Great. Now you know that that's a thing that you need to bring up more often. Or you bring up the accountability groups and you see them kind of zone out. Uh, so that way you know that, okay, this is something that just like my customer demographic isn't super interested in. Like this is just not the way that they enjoyed learning. So those one-on-one -on -one calls will help you quite a bit because you'll be able to see the reactions. You'll be able to gauge how people are thinking about what you're saying. Uh, just keep in mind that when you are building something from scratch, selling it is going to be very hard. Uh, and your close rates, uh, the number of people that actually buy on the call is going to be pretty low. It's going to hover around 10 to 20 percent. Uh, and that's OK. It's just because like buildings, anything from the ground up is really difficult. And so you're just going to have to do a lot of calls. Just expect that most of the calls say no. And that's OK. Uh, keep iterating on your offering, figure out where their eyes light up and start doubling down on more and more of those experiences. And that's where you'll see your close rates start to jump up. We had a couple of questions. Yeah, let's do it. Um, okay. I don't want to mispronounce your very French name, <laughs> uh, but she's asking about the pricing between like an online course versus a membership. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so figuring out the difference between an online course and a membership. Um, can I just ask what you're charging for the online course right now? Yeah, we are charging we are charging um, five hundred bucks, but it's way not enough <laughs> because what we do is like very precious and precise. Yeah. But it's a hobby, then, so people are not ready to charge that much yet. So yeah. that's why also we want to go in a membership because it takes time, and we think that they're going to stay longer. And even if the price is smaller each month, because they're going to stay at the end it's going to reach the price that we want. That's like yeah. faith, faith, faith. Mm -hmm. <laughs> got yeah. it. Got it. Okay. I love that. So, so my approach to pricing is actually a little bit different. Um, I price things at whatever I want them to be at that I can reliably get people to pay. Uh, and so what I would think about is initially, how much money do you need to be making every year for this to be worth it? So the, the example that we gave over here in the talk was 120,000 a year, right? So if we have 120,000 a year, that means we're making 10,000 a month, right? And that's my head just thinks in monthly easier. So if I, you know, am charging a hundred per month, then that means I need a hundred customers to hit this. If I'm charging 150 a month, and that's like realistically the most I can get these people to pay, then I need 66 customers. But like, this is kind of the way that I think about it is like, what can I reliably charge people that they're willing to pay? And then let me build and craft the experience around that that fits it, that I can also deliver reliably without having to work until you know midnight every day. Um, and so that's kind of how I'm thinking about it. So if you think that for this specific offering, people are realistically willing to pay 50 bucks a month, then you need 200 customers and you need to figure out what is the services and the value that you can offer for 50 bucks a month that doesn't take up an immense amount of your time, but that can bring these folks on. So that's, that's kind of the way that I would think about it is your customers really set the price point. What I actually ask people on sales calls to get an understanding of what their willingness to pay is, is what is the like it, for you like what is a good price point for this where you feel like it's fair you know you're you're paying for the service and you're happy and then what is the most that you would ever be willing to pay for this you know at the point where you would be like double checking like is this enough for me uh and so i always try to get like what is the maximum amount that people are willing to pay for it and then i'll add 20 percent to that because usually people are like always going to like anchor it down a little bit uh and that's how i get to my pricing so that might be the easier way of just like jump on a call with your folks and say like hey we want to build this membership this is kind of how we're thinking about it this is the end goal of the membership realistically what would you be willing to pay a month all right what is the most amount of money that you'd pay a month to, to the point where you would have to like double check if you want to keep paying for this right do that and then add on 20 percent, and then go out and start selling it and see what happens 
Um, right. But then at that point, what you've done is you've gotten the perfect price point. Now you just need to optimize the offering and make sure that you can deliver it and it delivers enough value, but it also does not take an immense amount of time because for like a 50 bucks a month price point after a certain point, like you cannot be jumping on a call with every single person. Like that business just does not scale at all. Mm. I have a question around that too. Would, would your course be part of your membership? Like you would drip it out inside the membership. Okay. So yeah. that might affect your pricing too. I would think. Yeah. If there's like a but, full course included in it. Yeah. Th at that point, even what I would even consider is like, you can have people pay for the course and then you can have the membership as an option after they complete the course. Uh, you, yeah. yeah. Then I would just expect that. Yeah. So I, I would expect that there's going to be a little bit of a drop off rate. So if you say like, all right, 30% of people will purchase after the course, I'm just making that number up. But if you say like 30% of people will purchase after the course, then, you know, how many people do you need to be getting into the course to actually like make the membership worthwhile? And like, what is the minimum amount of revenue that the membership needs to make in, let's say six months for it to be worth continuing, right? Uh, this is something that like uh, Tatiana Figueredo, she's one of my like favorite community experts. Uh, she does, a, a, she talks about this a lot is this idea of creating these like limited time tests for the community offerings that you're giving and like kind of reevaluating every three months, every six months to make sure that either you are hitting your mark or you are on target to hit your mark pretty soon, right? Like you can see the end in sight and you can see the path towards it. Um, but yeah, if, if you are charging for the course up front, then I would kind of bake that in and I would figure out like, all right, what is uh, you know, in year one, like how much money do you need to make from each person for it to be worth it? Um, but yeah, that's, that's sort of like how I would think about it is like the pricing first and then craft the offering around that second and figure out what is actually doable. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Questions. Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, just answering Cheryl's question real quick. So, so Misty was spot on is it's just like, what is the maximum price point you'd be willing to pay for, let's say, this, you know, community offering uh, and then add 20 percent to that because people will always give you a lower price than what they would actually be willing to pay. And then cool. um, Vana asked, how do you deal with the challenge of getting people together with their very busy schedules? I'm guessing she's talking about the events. Um, yeah, that's a good question. The events have to be valuable enough for people. And, and that's like a, a hard, tough answer for me to give you. But that's like the reality of it is that, you know, we've found communities of like folks that run private equity firms that are jumping on events every two weeks. Right. And if you think about that, like everybody in that community uh, has enough money to buy my entire apartment building. Um, their time is very, very, very valuable. But if you create events that are actually driving enough value for your customers, they'll move their schedule around, they'll drop stuff and they'll focus on it. So my my immediate question, Vana, is if the events that you're putting together and scheduling aren't getting enough people in there, maybe there's a disconnect between the way that you're marketing the event, the way that you're talking about it, what you're putting together, uh, or the way that you're marketing it to that set of folks, right? It's not saying that it's impossible to get those folks on a call, it's just figuring out there might be some other pain point, there might be some specific problem, or even some way of phrasing what the event is about that is way more conducive to getting them to jump on a call. We noticed this in the hearth is uh, when we were running tutorials and events, what we found is the three biggest problems that people were facing were monetizing their community, growing their membership size, so getting more people in the door, and then growing engagement, so getting their members to be more active. Those were like the three biggest problems that we were seeing. Any event that was tied to one of those three problems, easily we could get 100 plus RSVPs. Any event that was not tied to those three problems, we were struggling to get like 50 people to RSVP, right? Exact same audience, exact same marketing, no change, but it's just the content. It's the value that they're actually getting out of the event. Like why should they take a time, take an hour out of their schedule to like come in and attend that? David actually had a question around that. He said, one of my largest issues is to establish the sales funnel and how to get people there to even like get eyeballs on your stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the funny thing, I think sales funnel is like this big like phrase that has become overblown over the last like 10 years. Like sales funnels are important, right? And like we think about it quite a bit, uh, but you don't really need a funnel at the, at the early stages. Like you just need to keep talking to people and getting them in the door. So like step one is how do you talk, how do you find people that are interested in the things that you're interested in? Right. Um, 
if you are doing this in person, like maybe it's just going and talking to like local churches uh, and figuring out like, hey, you guys are obviously doing a lot with your congregation. We want to build a program that helps people like, you know, build a closer, more personal relationship with the Lord. Like, are there people that would be a good fit for this? Right. Um, and just go and ask the local churches, to, like have people to uh, give that to you. Um Oh yeah, sorry. So this is yeah the, the first customer slide. So go and talk to those folks and you know get some help from them uh, and have them send people in. Uh, I would even consider just like posting on LinkedIn and saying like, hey, this is a thing that I want to do, uh, and you know I would love to like talk to other people that are trying to rebuild their spiritual relationship and go do that. Um, one of my one of my friends runs a company called Hallow. Uh, they're like a Catholic prayer app. It's basically like Headspace or Calm, but specifically for Catholics. Uh, and that's really what they did is they just went around to churches uh, and they would go and ask the you know pastor, hey, can we you know do a quick five minute talk? Uh, and then they would go do that. Yeah, Alex Jones. He's a not not that Alex Jones, other Alex Jones. Uh, he's a really good guy. Really really nice. Um, we went through we went through an accelerator together actually a couple of years back. Um, but yeah, so what they did is they just, they literally went to churches, they asked the pastors, they emailed them beforehand, and they asked the pastors, like, hey, can I go speak to your congregation for five minutes? And then they would have a clipboard, they would gather emails, and then, you know, they would send them uh, messages and say, like, hey, this is how, this is the app, this is what we're doing. Uh, and that's really how they grew. And then, you know, long term, they started doing all the Google ads, and they started working with, like, Mark Wahlberg and, like, all that other stuff. But, like, in the early days, it was Alex just flying all over the country and going to every single church and talking to them. Uh, and so sometimes it's it's literally just that, like go uh, beat the pavement and like go meet your customers where they are and see if you can get a couple of them to give you their email and like start having a conversation there. Awesome. So, David asked another question about, um, is it better to have a whole offer versus a series of courses on how to get to the end goal? Yeah, um, good question. Um, I like having one singular offer because what I like about it is you can tailor all of the messaging and all of the optimization and all of the tweaking that you're doing around one thing. And my kind of mentality here is let's get the one offer hyper optimized to the point where the second that the right person sees it, it's like a 70, 80% likelihood that they convert and buy on the spot. Like that's what I'm trying to figure out is I'm trying to figure out who are the people that I can talk to and I can talk to them about heartbeat. And it's like an 80% conversion rate. Like I don't want 8%. I want 80%. Um, so that's kind of what I focus on. Um, and I would say that just like kind of bring it all together as one cohesive offering and then continue to optimize that. And then we had one last question. Um, Natasha said um, she teaches French, Spanish, and English and wanted to know if she should split that into three different memberships or just one. I would do, uh, I would probably do three different memberships. I don't know. I, actually, what I would do is I would just start with one language because my guess is, is French speakers are slightly, or people that are interested in speaking French are slightly different from those that are interested in speaking Spanish who are slightly different from those who are speaking English. And like, you know, there's already Duolingo online. So like anybody that just generally cares about language learning uh, is just going to go and immediately download Duolingo. And that's going to capture all of your like generalist population. Now, you and I know that Duolingo does not actually solve the problem. And so if they actually continue on Duolingo, they'll have a reason. But there's usually a reason why they want to learn that language. Uh, like my girlfriend, she's a surgeon. She actually what she learned uh, Spanish in college or in uh, high school. And she really wishes she continued in college because she had has a lot of patients that only speak Spanish and they always have to bring in a translator and it makes difficult and things like that. Right. And so like, she's actually seen some communities of like just teaching doctors how to speak Spanish with their patients and that's it. Right. And so what I would think about, yeah, is I would figure out like, what are the really powerful use cases over here that people are trying to learn these languages for pick one of those languages with a good audience that you have access to that you maybe have some advantage on, or maybe you have some friends that are kind of plugged in there and then focus on that, build the offering, expand it and get that revenue to stabilize and then go and, you know, start on the next language and then start on the next market segment. Like that's kind of how I would approach it. Does that make sense? Cool. I love your idea on just niching that down even further, maybe because like your marketing can just really go towards that person. You know, like I live in Arizona. There's a lot of Mexican people here because we're so close to the border. And if like, if I want to go and refresh, you know, my my <laughs> ability to speak Spanish a little bit, you know, then I have a different reason that someone is like traveling to Spain, you know, for a summer and like wanting to go over there or something. So yeah, I love, I love that idea. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and that's one of the most powerful things. Like even when we started with Heartbeat, when we started with Heartbeat, we said, hey, we're going to build an all-in-one platform for communities. Uh, and then we're like, wow, that is way too broad. And then we said, all right, we're going to do an all-in-one platform for community businesses. Still pretty broad. Then we were like, all right, we're going to focus on these SMB community businesses that are trying to like build and scale up. Still way too broad. All right, we're going to focus on these SMB businesses that are scaling up and offering services and selling their knowledge online and struggling to do that in a scalable way. And that was like the perfect aha moment, right? Like those are the people that we can jump on a call with. And it's like an 80% likelihood that they're like, yes, heartbeat is the thing for me. Um, so like there, there is a, there's riches and niches. Like that's a really popular phrase. Um, cool. So, uh, jump it back into the slides. Um, you know, like I said, jump on calls with customers as, as quickly as possible. You'll learn so much by seeing when their eyes light up and focus on finding those true believers. Like you'll see people where, you know, you'll start talking in five minutes in their eyes instantly glaze over. They're not the folks for you. Instead, focus on the people that are absolute true believers. They get really, really excited about what you're doing. Uh, the ones where you jump off a call with them and then they send you a three paragraph email and you're like, yeah, this is a lot to deal with right now. Um, like those are the folks that are your people. So focus on them. Um, and then think about your pipeline at all points in time. Like, how are you getting new people in the door? Uh, and that's going to like reduce a lot of the stress and the headache is if you are constantly getting new people in the door, you will figure out a way to convert them. But if you stop bringing in new people into your sales pipeline, then you will really struggle. Uh, you'll constantly be over-optimizing and overthinking each call, each meeting with folks. So focus on the health of your pipeline at all points in time. Ignore the individual no's, uh, but at the end of each week, kind of review the trends of like why people are saying no, like what is working, what's not working. Because some people might say no and it's totally out of left field uh, where, you know, maybe they're speaking, uh, Natasha launches her like French community uh, and she's selling it and someone jumps in a call and it's just like, yeah, I don't like French people. I went to France once and someone was mean to me. And so I don't like French and I'm never learning the language, right? Like that's weird and you're never going to convert that customer. So we just kind of like throw it out of your mind and we're just going to focus on the people that are true believers. So that's kind of the way that you think about it is like when you get no's, you'll get so many weird, crazy, random no's. But when you get a yes, the yeses will all start to align around the same track. And so that's who you want to focus on. Um, and after that example, I just want to say the French are amazing people. Um, <laughs> uh, cool. So uh, diving in. And then the last thing is try to get the first month's rent up front. Like that's what you want to start off with is get the first check up front. Just tell them like, hey, this is, you know, for waitlisting you. Uh, and if you, well, we're going to launch the community on this date, you know, in a month in advance, uh, a month in advance, we're telling you about this. And then we're going to launch it, you know, December 1st. Uh, and if you don't like the community, by the way, we'll give you a refund after 90 days. Right. So you tell me, I'll press one button on Stripe. We'll refund everything. And again, that removes all of the risk from the customer side because it's like, if I don't like this, I get all my money back, right? Like, what am I actually losing here? And then the very last piece on this slide is do not worry about being 10x better at sales. It really does not matter yet. Uh, even great salespeople will have the exact same close rates as you. Like there's only so much optimization you can do on just the sales front right now. Just focus on running through the process and getting some leads in your pipeline. Uh, and then as you bring on these customers, give them a 10x better experience, give them the concierge experience. Don't worry about being scalable over here, be at their every beck and call and give them the off menu items that you wouldn't normally, because you are trying to build evangelists and zealots over here. You are trying to build the people that are going to go tell the next five people about your community and what you're doing. And you want them to have an absolutely life-changing experience here. Uh, these got to be the people that are annoyingly talking about this at all points in time. And then keep iterating, right? Like throughout this entire talk, what we've talked about is that you do have to keep testing out and trying new things and playing around with what works and what doesn't work. And this is the thing that most people don't do enough of. Like this is the reason why businesses fail is it's not because you didn't get enough customers. It's not because you didn't have enough revenue. It's because you as the founder didn't iterate enough and didn't try enough new things to make this work. Uh, and this is like really harsh advice to give. I'm saying this as somebody who has had a failed startup in his past. Like I have shut down companies before. It doesn't always work out, but like, the company fails because the founder stops working on it. And that's the, the honest truth. Uh, and so the iteration piece of this is so, so, so valuable. And what I can tell you is you will never get it right on the first try. You will get maybe some pieces of it right, but you're going to constantly have to keep tweaking it and iterating and changing and things will get better and better and better over time.
And then as you're doing that, keep getting feedback from your users. As you're just starting off, one-on-one -on -one calls are going to be the best. Once you pass 100 customers, start switching over to like surveys. That's going to give you a lot more valuable data versus just the loudest voices in the room. And then long-term, once you're past 1,000 customers, you can start looking at more usage data, you know, logins, engagements, comments, things like that. Uh, and so you can use all of these, but probably start at the top if you're just getting started and kind of focus on those areas. And then focus on speed over quality. Speed is going to be the biggest thing. Like I said, it's 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 all about iteration. It's all about trying new things. And what happens is as you test out things at a faster and faster clip, the knowledge will compound. The person that is testing out and trying out twice as many things each month, every month they're actually getting like 5x, 7x ahead of the person that's not because of how quickly that knowledge compounds. And so again, the speed of iteration and how much you keep testing new things just tends to be the number one indicator of whether your business is going to do really well or whether you're going to struggle. Uh, and it's it's crazy that you can narrow it down to just that small of a thing, but I have seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different types of businesses get formed. And this is the big thing that really makes a difference between the founders that make it and the founders that don't is the speed of execution and the speed of iteration. And so once you've thought through a lot of these pieces, once you've started playing around with them, scaling is actually not incredibly complicated. You're just gonna build the offering, build a community experience around and bring in the customers, iterate and improve and optimize the process of fulfilling all the promises you made in step one. And then once you've done that, you go and either expand your offering or you build new offerings and you scale it up. And this is kind of what I was talking about of like, we'll start with one language first with Natasha's community. We'll start with French maybe, and then we'll go to Spanish and then we'll go to English. But this is kind of what I mean is you'll go through this cycle, you'll get to the last step and then you'll go back to the first one and that'll allow you to expand the offering and expand the revenue. I hope you so, shotted that last page. <laughs> <laughs> that was gold right there. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. And, and, uh, Missy, I'll also shoot over the link. So like, if you guys need the slides or anything like that, awesome. you guys can do. Yeah. Um, cool. And some just quick, helpful scaling tips. These are some easy pieces of software to just have in place. Like HubSpot as a CRM to contain all your customer data, MailerLite or MailChimp for any kind of like email marketing that you're doing, Stripe for payments. And then we use Webflow for our website. Um, once you have passed the 5,000 a month in revenue mark, I would consider hiring on like a VA, hiring on some part-time freelance help, things like that. You will need to spread the load. Um, once you kind of get past this 5,000 a month in, in recurring revenue mark, the next thing that you need to worry about is optimizing your time as the founder and making sure that the processes that are figured out, you are handing off to someone else and you are the one doing the constant experimentation and testing. And so really final thoughts here is you need surprisingly little to get to 120K ARR, right? Like nothing that I said here was really rocket science. It's just a lot of hard work, uh, but it's all very doable stuff. Um, don't overinvest in the tools and the tech and the hiring. Just focus on your customers, focus on building out that sales pipeline and just having a really, really incredible community offering above all else. Uh, and really last thing over here before we close out is... Uh, um, if you guys are building a community, we'd love to have you build it on Heartbeat. I know there's quite a few people on the call that are already doing that. Um, we take care of all of the main features that you need to have a community, where you want to have your discussions, your courses, your documents, all of that. Uh, and then the biggest thing that we stand head and shoulders apart on is our payment suite, just making it as easy as possible for you to scale up revenue and grow. Um, you can use this link. Misty, you have, uh, so this is going to just redirect to Misty's referral link. Uh, Misty, do you want to just drop your referral link into the Zoom chat for folks? Got it. Awesome. Yeah. MistyDorman.com slash heartbeat. That's the perfect link to use. That's going to give you this discount. Um, and uh, that's that's going to be, uh, in my opinion, uh, obviously I'm biased, but the best community platform that you can go out and build on. Pretty awesome. <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, cool. I know we are right at time. Um Charlotte asks, can you give us examples of a, a virtual assistant? Uh, we we mainly hire virtual assistants from the Philippines. Incredible English, really, really great. They have uh, been hired by a lot of US companies already. So they tend to like know a lot of the best practices that like I care about. But that's usually what we do is we go and hire from the Philippines. Um, Upwork is a really great website to do it. And then onlinejobs.ph is another good website that's like a Philippines specific job board. Uh, David had one other question about um, if you create a wait list, what is a good delay from creating the wait list to launch day? Uh, it doesn't really matter. Like we've seen people do it for two weeks. We've people do it for a month, for six months. Like what actually matters more is are you giving people updates in the interim? Like every week, are you just sending like a quick update of sort of where you're at with the community? And it doesn't need to be like fully polished. Like you can just write some quick thoughts in 20 minutes and then send it out. Just make sure people know that you haven't like taken their money and run off. Like that's the biggest thing with a wait list is you just want to make sure that you're being open and transparent with everyone.
So just, we are just, at time. I want to let Murtaza, uh, it looks like he's got another meeting to do, but uh, real quick before we go, I just want to have you all type in the chat. Don't hit enter yet, but just type in the chat your favorite takeaway. And I'm going to tell you uh, when to press enter. And I just I just want to be able to show Murtaza some gratitude by doing this little waterfall of everything we loved about what he shared with us today. And I'll give you just a second share some love even if it's not a takeaway it could just be like a, a gratitude thank you and hopefully give me some thumbs up if y'all are ready okay we're gonna hit go <laughs> oh man that's so cool awesome <laughs> awesome, awesome. Uh, I we've done a lot of these in the hearth and this is actually my first time being on the receiving end of this Misty. Oh, good. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming in and just like laying down the fire today. And, you know, thanks to everyone who showed up for yourselves, for your businesses, participating like you did and just kind of doing the do. So <laughs> with that, I'll just say bye guys. Take care y'all. It's so great seeing you. Bye everyone. Thank you.